why Nashville chose Belmont over Fisk. In 1871, Nine Fisk students set out from Nashville on a mission to raise enough money from their singing to save their school. They were eventually successful in saving the school from financial ruin. But what they did for American culture has had global ramifications for nearly a century and a half. Today, Nashville is known as Music City USA because of its importance in the country music world. However, the first American global music superstars came from that aforementioned group of students, the Fisk Jubilee Singers. They are the ones that first drew attention to Nashville, then just a small town in Middle Tennessee recovering from the ravages of the American Civil War. It would be another 54 years until 1925 when WSM Radio and its grand old Opry broadcasts forever branded Nashville with the moniker Music City USA. Now, whether the story of Queen Victoria saying upon hearing the Jubilees in 1873, they must be from a music city, is fact or legend. The truth is, Nashville was famous for music long before WSM and the Grand Ole Opry. So, why is it then that a small former Baptist college founded years after Fisk has now been selected, anointed, Nashville's Music University. Much of it begins with the fact that when Fisk was founded, although it is the oldest institution of higher learning in Nashville, older even than Fisk's giant little sister Vanderbilt, it has always been discriminated against because it educated black people. Nashville's racist past has been a huge determining factor in Fisk not being funded and growing like Vanderbilt. It was mostly illegal and certainly socially unacceptable for whites and blacks to study together. Black people were cast and marginalized. Black achievements were embraced and reported begrudgingly or not at all. Ever since the Fisk Jubilee Singers became a global sensation, Nashville has publicly acknowledged their greatness while privately keeping Fisk itself separate and apart from the mainstream. When Fisk appeared on the scene, there was no school for Nashville's white population. Seven years after Fisk opened, Vanderbilt was founded with a $1 million gift from New York Railroad tycoon Cornelius Vanderbilt. Another 17 years later, Belmont Women's College opened its doors. Merging with Ward Seminary in 1913, Ward Belmont College was almost bankrupt when, in 1951, it entered into a relationship with the all-white Tennessee Baptist Convention. This relationship lasted until 2007, but before that, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, Belmont College was positioning itself to become a modern music school. I remember producing demos in Belmont's recording studios in the early 1980s. They had a 24-track studio with a Studer tape machine and a Harrison board. It was modest, but admittedly, it was forward-thinking. Fisk, at the time, was still a music school that ascribed to the old conservatory school of thought. Fisk's failure to see the coming wave didn't help. However, the reason Belmont has left Fisk behind has more to do with white country music nationals giving and investing in Belmont than Fisk's failure in vision. You see, at first by plan and caste, and later by tradition and habit, separatism has been slow to disappear from Nashville's socio-economic landscape. Country music has largely been a product of white Nashville. Only since Nashville desegregated in 1960, at the hands of the students from Fisk, TSU, Meharry, and American Baptist College, has the city eased the social segregation that was the status quo for so long. Still, the economic exclusion of Black Nashville is much more insidious as it has survived all efforts to be dismantled. Simply put, whites and blacks may play together, eat together, study together to an extent, 
but not share together in the city's major revenue-making enterprises. That's where we see Nashville's business community, time after time, dollar after dollar, building up, investing in, and publicly touting the praises of Vanderbilt and Belmont at the expense of Fisk, Tennessee State, and Meharry. The recent investment gifting that turned Belmont from a little Baptist college into a major player on Nashville's educational scene only highlights these observations. So now, let's take a closer look at how Little Belmont College became Belmont University, Nashville's music university. mentioned that the Tennessee Baptist Convention saved Belmont College financially from the 1950s through the 1970s. But around 1970, a major financial player came into the Belmont College picture. His name was Jack C. Massey. And Massey was one of the most successful businessmen in U.S. history. In 1964, Massey, already a millionaire from a surgical supply company he owned, bought a fast food company from its original owner, Harlan Sanders. That's right, Massey bought Kentucky Fried Chicken Corp and turned it into a $700 million a year business. Four years later, he co-founded Hospital Corporation of America, HCA, which has become the most successful for-profit hospital organization in American history. Another company Massey was involved with from the ground up was Correction Corporations of America. That's right, the private prison's behemoth that has incarcerated so many young black men was a brainchild of the man who was responsible for the health and welfare of millions of Americans. Of course, any businessman that makes that much money is practically forced by American tax law to be at least somewhat philanthropic. That's not to say that Massey didn't have a giving heart, though. The recipient of Massey's benevolence was two of Nashville's most prestigious educational institutions, Montgomery Bell Academy, a prep school, and Vanderbilt University. The third entity to receive large gifts from Massey was Belmont College. Massey gave so much to Belmont that they were eventually able to distance themselves from the oversight of the conservative Baptist Convention. To this very day, the effects of Massey's generosity can be seen on the Belmont campus as the Jack C. Massey Graduate School of Business stands there in his honor. Massey passed away in 1990 at the age of 85, and soon thereafter, Belmont acquired another gracious patron. His name, Mike Curb of Curb Records, a major player on Nashville's Music Row. Curb Records is the culmination of a long string of music business successes by Mike Curb, who has been described as one of the most successful record businessmen of the late 20th century. Mike Curb has given millions to Belmont to establish the Mike Curb School of Entertainment and Music Business and the construction of the Curb Event Center, both on the campus of Belmont University. The investments of the Tennessee Baptist Convention Billionaire Jack C. Massey and music mogul Mike Curb have served to turn Belmont into a substantial, if not major, university. Meanwhile, across town in North Nashville, generosity from Nashville's business community has not nearly been as easy to come by. It is reported that Mike Curb, who sat on Fisk's board of trustees, wrote a $1 million check to Fisk and partnered with auto dealer Bob Beeman to endow a chair for the director of Fisk's famed Jubilee Singers. However, no permanent structures, no recording studios, nothing of that kind are presently visible on Fisk's campus, and a one million dollar gift, although of course greatly appreciated, pales in comparison to the multi-millions of dollars infused into Belmont over just the past 40 years. Is it that Fisk is not worthy of Nashville's investment and benevolence? 
Surely that is not the case. Nashville was a sleepy little town until the students of Fisk brought international acclaim to it a century and a half ago. It was stuck in the mire of Jim Crow segregation until 1960, when Fisk students, along with those of TSU, Meharry, and American Baptist College, bravely pushed back against the racist practices of the stores and lunch counters downtown. Yes, Nashville's march towards becoming the international cosmopolitan metropolis it is today was largely initiated by the HBCUs in North Nashville. But has Nashville given its HBCUs the same level of love and support it has given Vanderbilt and Belmont? The answer, sadly, is no. The reason now is evident. Fisk is black, and Nashville needs to look at its past honestly and objectively and see this truth. Fisk is surely deserving of support. Fisk has done nothing but make Nashville proud since day one, from its Julie Singers to its storied alumni like W.E.D. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells, John Hope Franklin, John Work, Nikki Giovanni, John Lewis, Diane Nash, and countless others who have enriched this city and given so much, Fisk has been a beacon of light and a national treasure. Take an honest look, Nashville, and see what needs to be done to support this great university denied so long. The time is now to make things right. Find it in your collective hearts, Nashville. In this coming year, the 150th year of the Fisk Jubilee Singers, stand with Fisk and do for her what has to be done for any and every great institution of higher learning. Put Nashville's resources behind Nashville's oldest and most storied university. Look past color and honor the content of Fisk's character.